This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show, and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. Well, I know we've had to literally wait for a couple of weeks, but here we are. Don't worry, I have three or four more wait puns in the entirety of this episode. I know you're quivering with anticipation. Last week, we were talking about the judge's song, Joanna. Uh, and I had mentioned at the very beginning how like, I'm not a Catholic, not even a last Catholic. I'm just, I'm just a weird secular guy. So I brought up some of the religious imagery that I felt the song was trying to communicate. But I got a great email here this week from Monado, who provided a little bit more context. And they write, I am a Catholic, and I think your reading about Judge Turpin and Joanna's song is correct. But there is an extra element I want to add. In the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, the mea culpa is used in three senses. One, the recognition of being a sinner. Two, it is said before a priest or in a church during Mass to be publicly recognized as someone fallible, something that Judge Turpin would not do because of that devout image he projects in public, but he has to, to keep projecting that image. And three, it is a way to enter into communication with God, something like, God, I am unworthy of you because I am a sinner, but I will talk to you anyway because I'm worthy now that I recognize that I'm unworthy. I do like that he does dot, 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 yeah, I know, <laughs> after that description. There is much talk of how Christianity and guilt have a toxic relationship, but it is important to talk about the appearance of guilt. Nobody is perfect, but if I recognize myself as imperfect before me, before God, before Joanna, before others, then I will be good, humble, and worthy of God's grace, and perhaps Joanna's body, I mean, love. Anyways, for now, thank you so much. I think that that provides a little bit more context that I think really builds it out. As this episode is going up, I think we're 29 days away from me being in New York City again. And so I am here to ask anyone who is knowledgeable about this sort of thing, if there are things that are going to be happening in New York City from about the 20th to the 27th, and you're like, Kyle, you need to go and do this. Please let me know. You can send that to putting it together podcast at gmail.com or you can go to any of the DMs of my social media platforms. Let me know. I'm trying to fill out my week because for seven days I'll have literally nothing but time and I don't want to wait around. Okay, so that's pun number two. I apologize. Anyways, let's get into this episode. I'm talking with Shane Wilson about the song Wait. Let's get into it now. Why doesn't Beatle Bamford come? Before the week is out, that's what he said. And who says the week is out yet? It's only Tuesday. Ah! Easy now. Hush, love, hush. Don't distress yourself. What's your right? Shane Wilson, thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. You know, this is your first time, of course, being on the show. So there's a couple questions we always like to ask. I guess first off, what is your background with Stephen Sondheim in general? I had Sondheim in my life, I guess, because we were a family that had cast albums. Mm -hmm. So we had West Side Story. We had Gypsy. And I think I, we had a tape of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum that I frequently rewound and replayed. Uh, everybody ought to have a maid. That, that song just amused <laughs> me endlessly uh, but when i went to college my freshman year the university had put on a production of merrily we roll along oh wow and i was enraptured immediately uh by watching it and that was the moment where i said i need to know more about whoever made the yeah. show can you articulate why that is do you think like what was it about merrily that was like oh my gosh this is amazing i think Part of it, I, I'm sure it's the part of it was the backward structure. I think I always like things that are a little off kilter. And I, I was I was not familiar with Pinter's betrayal. I was not familiar with any other stories that use that mechanism. So I think I was really excited by that. Also, I, it's funny because I think all the reasons are the reasons that people don't like Stephen Sondheim traditionally. I found yeah, yeah. him very hummable. I, I found his songs <laughs> extremely memorable. And I think probably being a college student, too, and the show is sort of about the idea of you know, you're at the cusp of adulthood. You're about to go out into the world uh, and and don't throw away your opportunities and don't sell out. I think those messages probably resonated very strongly 
Right. Uh, but it, whatever it was, the whole combination of just a very solid production and a very interesting message and a very interesting delivery system, I think that all worked together to really intrigue me. All right. So from uh, Merrily We Roll Along, then where do you go from there? To the campus library uh, to start <laughs> checking out as many cast albums as I can find. I, I definitely took advantage of the the CD revolution and, mm-hmm. uh, and brought a lot of cast albums uh, back to my home. And of course, one of them would be Sweeney Todd, which actually at the time I could only get what was called the highlights disc, right? Yeah, which was yeah. sort of a, a one a one disc summary. Uh, and it took me a while to track down a copy of the two disc set so I could enjoy the I've entire score. Never really explored that highlights version, but like, what what do they cut out from the original Broadway cast? I won't lie; it's been a long time since I've I've bothered uh, with the mm-hmm. the edited version i think you lose a lot of the moments that seem transitional okay uh, i think they they try and focus on big numbers so you're gonna get uh nothing's gonna harm you probably the uh the parlor songs probably got <laughs> cut uh, i I'm, I'm sure that was missing the most important songs of the show i should the most the important songs. <laughs> <laughs> i i do think also i, I don't know if all the the transition scenes, if all the Ballad of Sweeney Todd yeah. moments made it in, it, it's entirely possible the song we're going to talk about uh, may, may not have made the cut, as it, as it probably to the RCA executives may not have seemed like the most essential thing to include. Sure. But the important thing is songs that really held my interest, like A Little Priest yeah. uh, and God That's Good, those definitely made the cut. So I guess that kind of answers the follow-up question, which is when were you first introduced to Sweeney Todd? How long was it before you actually got the full cast album? Probably by the time I was out of college. So it maybe took a few years. It maybe took four or five years to actually get hold of the whole thing. Yeah. And then I didn't end up seeing it for many years later. I guess it's maybe not so true now, but at the time it felt like too big a show uh, right. for a lot of theater companies to want to put on. I think it, it took a while before they said, oh, that we might be able to make an advantage out of that. So the production I ended up seeing was actually the uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago. So I saw it on uh, as big a stage as possible. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. W- what is it about this show, though, that kind of keeps you coming back? Wow. I, you know, I I was actually writing about this the other day. I mean, Sondheim, he he likes his stories to be a little off kilter and he he would tell you that's not the case. But actually, in the introduction to Look, I Made a Hat, he talks about going to a show that was totally his kind of show. And it had murders and blood mm-hmm. and mayhem. And it just he, he loved the, the grand theatricality of it. And this show, I think, speaks to all of his personal theatrical interests. So you can really feel his passion for it. And I just it's fun to describe to people. Yeah, it's it's a musical about a man who murders many, many people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's, you know, no one likes murder, but everybody likes the the grand tropes of Guignol and all the not operatic, but all the, the grand elements that go with that. And it just combines the humor and the horror and all the things that that make for a great night of theater. Yeah. And it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful <laughs> music. I know. I mean, also, it's also great. I mean, in the in the email exchange that we were having back and forth, you kind of mentioned some of the, the I guess, the bona fides that make you be someone that I should be talking with. One of them being you have seen every single Sondheim show, at least a, a version of it put on stage. Uh, I think with the sole exception of Do I Hear a Waltz. Is that correct? That was the exception. Yeah, that yeah. Was the, that's the one that uh, no one seems to be eager to put on a production. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I could probably count on one hand how many productions have been put on in the last like 20 years. <laughs> so I, any standouts from there, whether it was Sweeney Todd or, or different ones, like what are some of the, the better ones you've seen? Oh, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I have to say that that college production of Merrily, I mean, was was a great kickoff. I mean, mm-hmm. that did a lot to 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 jumpstart things. I actually got to see Bounce when it was in Chicago in sort of what they hoped was its pre-Broadway stage. Right. And that was fascinating because that's really it's really the only time I've had a chance to see a Sondheim show that was new. Yeah, uh, yeah. A Sondheim show that yeah no one else had ever seen before, and that had a huge excitement. And I also got the experience of watching it once when it was new, and then I went back and watched it a second time. So I, I kind of got to have that sense of, okay, now that I know what's coming, do I see what works? Do I see what's maybe not working? Do I see why that show's not hitting the way I want it to? Yeah, yeah. So there's... There, there, there was definitely that. Uh, I also, you know, Assassins is one of my favorites of his. Yeah. And I've seen a couple productions of that. That's in a way almost a foolproof show to put on because it's a review. Mm-hmm. And so you, you just kind of need actors who are willing to go for it 
and really em- embody these these very outlandish, very unsocial characters. Uh, so I think I, I've seen a couple productions. I saw one in Dallas and one in St. Paul, and they both I found interesting approaches to the material that were really intriguing. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I've I've I feel like this is a book idea or something like that about shows, like whether they be musicals or plays, that are essentially foolproof. Um, <laughs> as I mean, with the caveat being as long as you have good actors put into it, which sounds, I know, kind of dumb to say, but like, even if there's a bad direction of a musical, sometimes the performers can like just pull it off, if you know what I mean. And there's some shows that are like I, that, I where it's like, even if the director is not pulling their way, it's like, yeah, but the actors are great. So like, it, it works. I know exactly what you mean. And sometimes you just need that moment. I saw a production of Pacific Overtures Mm -hmm. and all you needed was the presentation of the opening number of the vanishes floating in the middle of the sea. And they staged it in such a way that you ended with all of the actors at the lip of the stage kind of belting at you. And it was so powerful. I kind of didn't care what happened after that. Sure. Uh, sure. Whereas whereas I saw a production of Anyone Can Whistle and, you know, the very strong cast, very, very professional, very exciting and yet that show just pulls and pulls them down and pulls them down yeah, and the, yeah. the, there comes a point where it's like you know the show's just too long and boring at this point the best actors in the world may not be able to to pull this out of the muck there's another thing that you do that is like right up my alley you are a fellow podcaster of course you i am are a co-host on the completists am i saying that right you are saying that correct yes weirdly and coincidentally like you go through usually like film series and make sure you see like all the different sequels and that sort of thing. So you complete the series sort of thing. That's that's correct. And as, as we're recording this, not when it's this is being released, but as we're recording this, it's very interesting how recently you just did the um, uh, the three colors series, right? The uh, yes, the blue, Lasky. blue, white, red, uh, which I literally just watched for the first time this week. So I thought that was interesting. Oh, wow. How did you like it? Here is how dumb I am. As a big cinephile, <laughs> I have known about the Three Colors series for a long, long time. Knew of it. I'm like, oh, it's on my list. I should, I should really see this. It's, it's on my list of shame. And finally, this week, I was like, you know what? I have time. They're not terribly long movies, so it's like I can, I can watch one of these each night, sort of thing. I was under the impression that Juliette Binoche was in all three of them. Like she was the main actress in all of them. So I just assumed after the first one that we would continue that story. Uh, and it's not, it's three different stories in each one of them. No, and that like, must've come as quite a surprise. I know. It's like, so when is Juliette Binoche coming back? Why are we focusing on this guy for so long? <laughs> Anyways, that was, that, that was completely my misunderstanding of how it goes, but I thought there were three solid little movies to, to be honest with you. I think, um, this is actually not, uh, not a criticism so much. When I stopped watching all three of them, I was like, you know what? That really reminds me of like solid, 90s dramas except in French <laughs> like that's basically what, what they are and there's a lot of symbolism I, and like they tie into each other and if you read the backstory of like what they were made for I think that adds to it but even if you don't know that I think there are three solid little dramas that you can watch yeah I think that there's probably a reputation that's oh they're they're art they are mm-hmm, great art mm-hmm. and they are they are the director's final statements in cinema and in life and they they have a weight to them and i was like you I'd, i had known of them and had not seen them whereas my co-host ted had seen them all and was shocked that i had not seen them yet yeah. and that of course made for great conversation but i definitely had that same feeling coming out oh well they're just movies they're just stories being told yeah, yeah. and what's and and they're very loosely a trilogy Right. They have the colors to unite them. They have uh, the director to unite them. But in many respects, they're three very different films. It's a wonderful excuse to just say, hey, I'm going to watch these three, these these three interesting movies because um, mm-hmm. they're all connected. And that's that's part of the philosophy of the show is sometimes it's just fun to really get into the weeds with the, the storytellers and the characters that that captured your attention once and maybe we'll do it again. Yeah. Well, we don't really need to wait any longer. We should probably talk about the song that we are here to discuss, which is wait. Um, I, I wonder if you have, before we kind of jump into the lyrics here, just as, as an overview, what do you, does this song speak to you, I guess at all inside of this show and like where it's placed? It's funny. Cause it, in on, in the one hand, it really doesn't mm-hmm. <laughs> when you uh, I, I'm sure you've done plotting along. Uh, but of course, we've just come out of a very a couple very big moments. We've had mm-hmm. uh, the showdown with Pirelli. And then we've in some cases, we've had the judge and his soliloquy, uh, his 
yeah. his, his interesting moment. I was going to say, like, we have just seen an old man reach orgasm on stage in some <laughs> cases. And now we're going to hear. As we've all wished yes, over the that's years. Right. Uh, that did not make the highlights disc, by the way. That, <laughs> <laughs> I am shocked. It's, it's, it's astonishing. Uh, so it, it definitely feels when you actually pay attention to the number, like this doesn't need to be here. This is actually a song about not doing anything. Right, and right. And and when when I was listening to it, I thought, well, I, what am I going to say about a song that's literally telling me not to do anything, to just sit tight and just hold on a moment? But uh, w- when you get into it more, it really serves Sondheim the dramatist. Right, I, right. I always think it's interesting that his initial notion was that he was going to write the book as well because he thought it was just going to be completely sung through and it would not be a problem. And I can see this as being a moment where he said, OK, I'm going to take a moment for character. I'm going to spend some time setting up who Mrs. Lovett is and who she is to Sweeney Todd. I'm going to take a moment to just stop the plot for a moment and get into the inner workings of these characters. And so I can see it being that kind of moment. But yeah, your initial reaction is, well, that's pretty. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and But let's get back to the story, please. And I, I think it, it takes a little closer inspection to find what's really going on. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. It depends on how you're staging the show. If you have, if you use the judge's song in there, it is like this really weird, I think, sequence of events where you have this whole like Pirelli's, the contest. So we've had a lot of Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd. We're now going over to the judge and now we're coming back for them to tell us, hey, yeah, just wait. You're, you're, things are going to be OK. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get to this plan soon enough. If you cut the, the judge's song, then yeah, it goes basically right to that, right? Contest. And then we're going here. Wait, right? We know exactly. we're setting the trap here, but we still have to, 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 to wait things out. At the same time, A, I really like the melody in this song. And I think, as we'll, as we'll discover, this is actually not the very first time, but follows in the footsteps of a lot of Sondheim songs, what he's known for, where he likes to play around with language and ta- and kind of break it apart and sometimes use adjectives as nouns. So um, there's, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about in the song, weirdly enough. I, I think, too, a lot of how this song plays really depends on how the particular production is setting up Sweeney Todd. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that, I think we're, we're the ones we're focusing on. If you've watched the, for example, the George Hearn production, he's very agitated. He's someone who really wants to get to it. He, he, he has one goal in mind, and that's murder. And it, you, this song then serves the purpose of calming him down and 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 slowing things. If you've watched the movie, uh, Johnny Depp plays very I have the reviewer in me wants to say comatose, uh, but he plays it very low energy, very just it. all his emotions yeah. are stuffed down and he's just not giving off any affect at all. And in that interpretation, Mrs. Lovett actually sort of needs to seduce him a little bit. Yes. To say, OK, I know you're focused on the revenge, but hey, let's let, let, let's find the what's interesting in this. Let's find the reason that you're still alive. So I do think the song carries a lot of the weight of the interpretation of the production. Yeah. And I think to add on to that a little bit more, I think what people have to realize, too, is that while, yes, Sweeney Todd is bent on revenge, like that is his shining light, what he's m- moving towards. Uh, Mrs. Lovett doesn't really care about the revenge. <laughs> she, like, really, at the end of the day, she could take it or leave it. She wants Sweeney Todd. That's who she wants in her life. So anything that's going to basically keep him in her clutches is what she wants to do. So, yeah, for her, we want to wait we could because uh, I can help you out with all these other plans that you have. But she doesn't really care, I don't think, if he ever enacts vengeance on the judge. I think that's not even on her list of things that she wants to get done. No, and that and that works in either direction. She doesn't yeah. care if he ever does, and she doesn't care if he ever doesn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's lots of dialogue that, of course, is is played for humor that points yeah. out that she's like, yeah, we'll, you'll you'll kill him, and then you'll kill someone else, and it'll be fine. It'll just as long as you're happy, then I'm happy. Uh, but yeah, she she's also quite prepared to string him along. This is just Kyle breaking into the episode to talk about some of the people and organizations to help this show continue to go. If you would like to support the show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in. That's greatly appreciated, of course. And if you'd like to help monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. 
please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I do want to give a shout out to three new patrons that we got this week. So thank you, Marla. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Beth, for becoming new patrons over on Patreon. I also, of course, need to give a huge thank you to the God That's Good tier, Jack, Todd, Carrie, Louise, and Christopher. Playing Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. They also happen to be a sponsor this week, so let's go and listen to one of our other great shows. Hi, my name is Kyle. I'm Dave. And I'm The Machine. And we do a podcast called Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine. It's a podcast where a sentient machine is forcing us to watch movies in order to prevent it from initiating the apocalypse. Although, Dave, you and I tend to talk about the ideas of the movie rather than the movie itself. Well, it's the machine's fault, like everything, and then by effect your fault, Kyle, that you've invited me, and this is the only thing I like to talk about. I mean, I'm not going to face the apocalypse alone, so you seem like a good patsy to bring along with me. If you wanted somebody that was going to give you some hope, you picked the wrong person. Kyle and Dave vs. the Machine is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. New episodes are out every Friday. This week, we are also brought to you by the Edmonton Community Foundation. The foundation acts as a bridge between donors and charities to create a strong, vibrant community for generations to come. You can start an endowment fund yourself or with a group. Once it reaches $10,000, it can start distributing funds. Vital Signs is an annual checkup conducted by Edmonton Community Foundation in partnership with Edmonton Social Planning Council to measure how the community is doing. This year's focus is on making ends meet in Edmonton. If you want to find out more, you can go to ecfoundation.org. Well, let's jump into these lyrics here then. So, okay. by the way, as far as line readings go, I think I've already mentioned this in an episode, but uh, I don't know why. It, it, this always makes me laugh how Angela Lansbury starts the song in like the, the book section that usually gets attached to the beginning of this song. Because you have Sweeney go like, why doesn't Beetle Banford come before the week is out? That's what he said. And then she goes, and who says the week is out yet? It's only Tuesday. <laughs> and he was like, bah. The way she says that, though, makes me laugh every single time. And I don't know why. It doesn't make me laugh when other actresses do it. It's only the way that Andrew Lansbury actually says that line. She has a jauntiness to her. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's something, if you watch in A Little Priest, mm -hmm. where she tells the, uh, the, the general admiral joke, and she does a little jig afterward. <laughs> and I don't know if I've ever seen anyone else yeah. do a little dancing jig. And I think that's kind of key to who she is, that other people are playing the humor, but she's, there's a real joie de vivre that she has yeah. uh, that I, I think that's, that's what you're picking up on. Yeah. But she, she goes into it then and goes, Easy now, hush, love, hush, don't distress yourself, what's your rush? Keep your thoughts nice and lush, wait. Hush, love, hush, think it through, once it bubbles, then what's to do? Watch it close, let it brew, wait. Easy now, hush, love, hush, don't distress yourself, what's your rush? Keep your thoughts nice and lush. Hush, love, hush, think it through. Once it bubbles, then what's to do? Watch it close, let it brew. I've been thinking. Fly. Well, the, the first thing that you'll notice is there's only one two-syllable word, or there's, maybe there's two two-syllable words in, the, yeah. in both of these. There's distress and bubbles. They're all really short words. They're all pointed and and get right to it and that speaks to her character she's not going to go into to lengthy verbose speeches mm -hmm. but it's also you know for all we talk about Sondheim and and his verbal tricks he also chooses the moment you know, the, certain characters have that in them and Mrs. Lovett doesn't Mrs. Lovett is is very pure in that sense and so it's interesting how this language really speaks to her character that these nice simple short words like I love the word brew brew yeah. such a wonderful word in that context 
there was a, um, an improv team that I cannot remember now who they are. I'm pretty sure they were out in California, but they do. They did this um, performance of like improvised song time a few years ago. I just remember watching an interview with them and one of the cast members were saying, what a lot of people think you need to do when you're quote unquote like improvising <laughs> Stephen Sondheim to make it sound like one of his songs is that you need to be like this super verbose, like uh, ornate language. And it's like, actually, it's harder than that. You have to actually express a really complicated idea using simple language. And that's what's hard to improvise. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think that the trio of songs that we're talking about. So we just had Pirelli, who is not just verbose, but is accented. Right. So he's saying a lot because he's a salesman and because he's trying to obscure uh, his, his his the truth of him, that that's a character who needs to be just spewing words. Right. Uh, the judge in his soliloquy, of course, part of it is he has very lofty language. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll see you on the morrow is is something that no other character in the show is going to say. <laughs> uh, but he and he's also trying to obscure his true self. Mrs. Lovett is not trying to hide herself at all, so she can use very plain language. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's worth noting is musically. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, at almost every version I've heard of this song, the word weight is held. And so a lot mm. of these words get their own note, you know, nice and lush. Each gets its own note. But weight is held. I think only Helena Bonham Carter is the, on the only performer I've seen who says it short and, and cuts it short. And that may be why I don't like her version quite as much. I, I think the other big thing here is with this language that we're using here, these short, um, direct words, it, it all comes back to the same thing, which is like, listen, you i know that you want to go out onto the streets and start like slicing throats basically but you, that brew line is like once this gets past the threshold it's going to happen anyways so don't worry about it this is kind of like those like business coaches coming out and being like you know self-actualize and like if you think it you'll do it type of thing and that's basically what she's doing here it's like hey if you if you keep your thoughts nice and positive and in this case is killing the judge. But like, if you keep your <laughs> thoughts nice and positive, it's going to happen. Like, you don't have to rush things. Just just wait for it all to fall into place. And I find that kind of like really hilarious at the same time. Kyle, I think I'm now picturing your line of accessories posters that are all <laughs> Mrs. Lovett. Which, that's right. That's right. Think it through. Hush, love. Hush. It's just her like Success. hanging onto a ledge. Hang in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to point out that a couple of the things she's saying are really she's trying to inject the joy into it you know mm -hmm. when she says keep your thoughts nice and lush of course his his lush thoughts are about blood <laughs> that's, yes. that's what he's thinking of but she's she's trying to to basically put the positive spin on it like you're saying she's trying to show this this is going to be great this is it's it's going to happen and it's going to be wonderful when it does or when she says you know, once it bubbles then what's to do it's like it it's it's something's coming is what she's doing yeah. she's, this is her something's coming moment <laughs> yeah, this is she's tony in this play so so just talking about performers so who is it that you said that you didn't like the performance of i think helena bonham right. carter I think and part of it is, of course, she's she's all head voice. I mean, she mm -hmm. actually it, it holds it too nicely, but it's it, it's a it's a thin voice. And I think you it, as a result, it takes a lot of the joy out of the character of Mrs. Lovett. She becomes a very inert, very pessimistic character. She's also more sexualized, I think, inside of the movie version of Sweeney Todd, which I, I always have to jump in and be like. I am a bit of a defender of that movie in many ways. I actually do like it overall, but uh, specifically in this song, what I find the weirdest, and I don't know enough about music production, I could be totally off base here, but there are like the kind of like book scenes of her performing uh, and talking to Johnny Depp in the scene. And then when she jumps into singing, it sounds so weird because I think that they've auto-tuned it or done some sort of production on her voice. It's like, well, whoa, what, what voice is happening? Like, what happened here? It just sounds so <laughs> different and incongruous to the scene that she was just talking in. Because I don't have that same thing with other songs she sings in. So I don't know what it is about this song on the on the recording. that makes it sound so odd to me. I think for me, the problem is that it's that you don't get contrast. 
Mm-hmm. That Mrs. Lovett should feel like a very different kind of person than Sweeney Todd. Mm-hmm. And you know, Angela Lansbury feels very different than Len Cariou. Right. Uh, or, you know, Patty Lapone feels very different from Michael Cerverus. There's that thing where if you're doing if someone around you is doing an accident, you will sort of and accidentally slip into that accent. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel that that's what happens is that Helena Bonham Carter's, oh, well, Johnny Depp's gone goth. I'll I'll be going goth as well. Right. And you don't get the balance. And that's I, I like the movie fine. We actually watched it again just last night. Yeah. And I, I think the problem is that I know other ways it can be done. I've sure. seen and heard other versions and I like them a little better. And I just it feels the movie feels like it's it's stuck in. Everything's gray. Everything's dark. Everything's grim. And there's there's not the variety that the show seems to actually have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mrs. Lovett continues on and says, I've been thinking flowers, maybe daisies to brighten up the room. Don't you think some flowers, pretty daisies might relieve the gloom? I'll wait, love, wait. I've been thinking flowers, maybe daisies to brighten up the room. Don't you think some flowers, pretty daisies might relieve the gloom? Always brooding away on your wrongs. What happened ever knows how many years ago. This is a very short section because the rest of it is going to be like the end of the song. I know that this isn't like the most profound song Sondheim has ever wrote or is even like probably in my top five of songs of this show. At the same point, I just like that uh, what we've seen with Mrs. Lovett is that her mind kind of like just goes all over the place often. So she's talking about waiting like flowers. We should put some flowers in, in this room and you're almost caught off guard. Be like, what are you talking about? I think it goes exactly to what you were saying before, that she's very single minded in her goal. She wants to have a romance with Sweeney Todd. And so her mind, it seems like it's flittering, but it's just going back to where it wants to go, which is the home life that she wants to have with him. I mean, that's, of course, by the sea is going to really bring that out uh, in in the Mm -hmm. second act. But at this point, she's starting to see the possibilities of it. It's like, oh, he's back in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got him here, but uh, we're going to have a domestic life. And part of that will be flowers. And I did I did a tiny bit of research for you, Kyle, because uh, okay. I wanted to see if there was some significance to the flowers. There's really not uh, They're 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 very simple flowers. I think like gilly flower is a stock flower. Yeah, uh, it's, it's something you used to, to fill out a bouquet. And so that might speak to Mrs. Lovett's character a little bit that she she's not ambitious in her flowers. She doesn't want roses or tulips. She wants daisies. But there is, of course, the fact that we we think of daisies in terms of death. Yes. Uh, pushing up daisies so there there might be a little bit of a joke in there i, I think there's a little bit of there um i, I was going to wait for this un- until we mentioned gilly flowers but I, I think you're right i don't think that there's any like extra hidden meaning other than their yeah common flowers that you can go and buy sure we could bring up like the like you just said pushing daisies to like symbolize death the only thing about gilly flowers is that those are sometimes depending on the person what you call carnations is what I've heard. Okay. Which is the, uh, the so there's two things. There's like red carnations specifically are the sim- symbol of the labor movement, which again, I don't know how much that really speaks to this show specifically, unless you really wanted to um, bend over backwards and try and be like, yeah, like it's all talking about like the working class versus like the, the, the rich class above them and how they're, you know, taking over sort of thing. But I think that might be ascribing a little bit too much meaning to, to Gilly Flowers. Yeah, well, I think on our flower podcast, we'll really get into this. But <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but I, I think here, I, I think you're right. That I think the, the most important thing it does is it really just shows that Mrs. Lovett has very simple tastes that, yeah. you know, to, to 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 brighten up the room. Any flower will do uh, that. And it doesn't have to be the fanciest flower. It'll be, it'll be the cheapest or the most readily available flower. But also what she's doing is she's this whole song is kind of she's a Sweeney whisperer. You know, she's she's trying to 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 calm him and she's trying to get his mind off of his his angrier thoughts. And again, this kind of comes back to how you portray it Mm -hmm. when you watch. I I did find a YouTube video that's uh, probably a a bootleg of the original performance with Angela and Len Cario. And Len Cario is definitely a live wire. You know, he's Mm -hmm. he's whole thing is he really wants to spring into action and part of what she's doing is calming him down and that this discussion of here's what the room could look like 
It's, right. it's I'm trying to distract you. So, oh, let's worry about this other thing. And if he spends enough time worrying about flowers, he'll forget how agitated he is right. that the beetle hasn't come. And because at right after this moment, he jumps back up. He, I, his line of dialogue is something like, you know, well, where is that? And the judge, when will I get him? You know, he, True. He, he, he's not totally pulled away from it. And she has to say, no, calm down. It's going to be OK. And that that's the job she's trying to do. Yeah. But she say something like, like, oh, you do have a one track mind or something. I can't remember what her actual response is. Yeah, here we go. I've got. Can't you think of nothing else? Always brooding away on your wrongs. What happened? Heaven knows how many years ago. This this I love how that speaks to her amorality. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, whatever it was that happened to you, your wife being <laughs> no, poisoned, your wife and being your murdered, daughter, potentially, and, and you being sent off to Australia for prison for, for decades. It's, uh, what, forget about that. Don't live in the past. Well, I think, again, that that is actually interesting to um, how this there's echoes of this song again throughout the show, because what happens at the very end before he throws her into the oven is like what's what's past is past. Right. I should have been listening to you all this time because this song gets an interesting reprise. This is this, of course, starts off Epiphany. Yes. That she tries to 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 start in again the, the, with the same words, easy now, hush, love, hush. And you can kind of tell this is a ritual at that point. This yeah. is what she does. He gets excited. And this 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 is her mantra. This is what she does to calm him down. And that's the moment where it doesn't work. I like that idea of her being a Sweeney whisperer. It's probably why most productions <laughs> have her feed him a sugar cube at the very end of this. Yeah, it's it's, it's like it's it's easing the, a tantrum from a child. That's right. Um, okay, well, this is how she ends things here by singing slow, love, slow time. So fast now goes quickly. See, now it's past. Soon will come. Soon will last. Wait, don't you know, silly man? Half the fun is to plan the plan. All good things come to those who can wait. Gilly flowers, maybe instead of daisies. I don't know, though. What do you think? Slow, love, slow time. So fast now goes quickly. To plan a plan, all good things come to those who can wait. Gilly flowers, maybe, instead of daisies. I don't know, though. What do you think? Well, the first thing is at the, at the very end, the, the question of whether or not Sweeney responds kind of tells you where he's at. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of productions, you'll see him just kind of say yes. And I yeah. think that's what's actually in the script. And it'll be a very dazed yes. So it's that's like right. oh, she's she's achieved her goal, calmed him down. In the movie, Johnny Depp doesn't respond at all. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, speaks to the character he's created in there. But it's the way he, he's, he's just not even entertaining outside input at that point. He's just so focused on his anger and his revenge. So I think that's that's the first thing that I take from that is you you get to gauge how well did this work? How how well mm -hmm. was was Mrs. Lovett's technique this time around? Probably pretty good. Probably calmed him down. <laughs> this is a great example of that thing that Sondheim loves to do, which is really analyze language. I've talked before on this show about how Into the Woods was kind of like my introduction really to Stephen Sondheim. And there's a whole song about having like and or or, which I always found so fascinating uh, and partly probably why I went and got an English degree at university. And here's kind of <laughs> the same thing. We're going now and soon. Now goes quickly. Literally, the idea of now, that concept of now goes way too frequently. And soon, the idea of soon is going to come and the soon is going to last for us. Uh, so there, he's turning adjectives into nouns and really kind of looking at those, which is, which is, I think, fascinating, uh, kind of a concept to, to think about. And I don't, again, I'm not thinking that uh, Mrs. Lovett specifically is like having those thoughts, but uh, it's infusing those, I think, kind of complicated ideas of like now, soon, I guess in kind of a poetic way, being like, Yes, like the now is super uh, awful to be in, but soon is going to come. It's going to change things. And that's what's going to last for us. So I don't know. It's a, kind of an interesting concept. 
Well, it is. And of course, he's explored this before. I mean, yeah. that's now soon and later mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. uh, A Little Night Music. He's working with these same words. And part of the fun of that is that each of those characters lives in one of those words right. until it becomes the trio. And then they can trade off. And you know, one person soon becomes another person's now. I, I So I, I do think Sondheim is obviously very intrigued by mm -hmm. that sense of time and what time means to us. Everything, I, yeah. I guess, I'm not the English major in this conversation, but it <laughs> probably feels very Proustian, uh, this oh, yeah. idea of, of living in the now and living in the past. And that's a funny observation to say, yeah, everything's past because it, it just happened. Right, yeah. right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, well, one, one man's now is another man's yesterday type of thing, right? Um, so exactly. The... This this also recalls the idea like um, a film reviewer that I like and I can't remember who it was now, but kind of made this statement I remember a few years ago that stuck with me, which is like if you want to distill everything down is that most art is about the passage of time um, and some more so than others. But really, it's all about like, how do we uh, interact with what's being thrown at us right now? But also like as we get older, you'll you'll notice that a lot of you know writers directors that sort of thing are really focused on like how does time affect a person and i think sweeney todd there's there's a lot to be said about how that affects sweeney todd how that affects mrs lovett how that affects johanna it's all to do with time and how they've spent it or how people have forced them to spend it and i think that's kind of being explored not like super in depth in this song but it is kind of like peppered in there for for people to think about well especially since this is a song about delayed gratification this mm -hmm. is a song where mrs lovett is literally saying you're going to get what you want you just need to take the time mm -hmm. and in in his book sondheim points out that that's this this song serves as a justification for why Sweeney Todd hasn't just marched down to the Old Bailey, found the judge and killed him. Right. That, if, that there, there's a satisfaction to be found in delaying the moment because, yeah, once it happens, it's over. Yes. And indeed, that's that's where the show's heading. You know, once he kills Turpin, what what's supposedly his next for him in Mrs. Lovett's mind? It's now we'll retire to this, you know, to our, <laughs> our, our seaside cottage yeah. uh, for him. I think, you know, life is over once once he's achieved that. Yeah, and I, I do think there is this, I guess it's not really dramatic irony, but I think there's this really fun juxtaposition for the productions who actually use the judge's version of Joanna in it, which is becoming more and more uh, of a thing, as I've heard. You've just watched a person <laughs> give themselves immediate gratification going into a scene that's like, hey, wait, don't. <laughs> immediately go off and, and, and uh, get what you want. It's better to wait. So I, I think that there's that kind of thing that's being played around with here, too. I, think I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right. Uh, the judge is definitely someone who went and got what he wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, morals be damned. Uh, and and we see that even he is wrestling with it, but that I don't think he regrets his decision. He just wishes that he wasn't so conflicted about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talking about that, like Sondheim does write after certain songs, some some notes about why he chose to do some of the lyrics and uh, some of the background of the song. Doesn't do it for every single one. Uh, this is a kind of a weird anomaly where he doesn't actually write right after wait his thoughts on that song. He actually waits uh, for a few other songs to transpire and basically writes He's about willing to delay his gratification. <laughs> exactly. So he waits until after Pretty Women to write this, where he says, in accordance with musical theater convention, especially opera, a chance to sing excuses everything, even dramatic logic. For example, if Sweeney is so intent on killing Judge Turpin, why does he spend three minutes singing a duet with his victim before dispatching him? I don't accept this convention any more than I do that of having a chorus of disparate people sing with one point of view. Sweeney's warbling away till Anthony enters allows the judge to escape and has to be justified. That is the reason for wait, the apparent purpose of which seems to be to calm Sweeney down. The real purpose being to establish his motive to wait on the proverbial grounds that revenge is a dish best served cold and that he enjoys playing with the judge the way a cat does a mouse. Wait is a song that doesn't seem necessary to the score or the action when it occurs, but it is essential in establishing this moment. And this moment is one I had planned from the day I began writing the show. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I, I think that what we keep coming back up uh, or keep coming butting up against here is like, yes, in isolation, as you're going through the score here, this seems like such a, a song like, oh, yeah, like we could cut this or like this doesn't really do anything. It's not advancing the plot seemingly. But once you get to 
at, at least through act one, but especially the entire show, it's like, no, like you needed to have this song here. It actually works on a bunch of different levels. Well, I, 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 I'm, you've seen enough movies to know that yeah. there's that moment of, boy, if, if they had a cell phone here, this movie would be over. Or right, right. if these two characters, <laughs> if these two characters would just admit what they wanted, this movie would be over. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you, And a lot of times the reason you call that out is because they haven't done a very good job of delaying it or right. or diffusing it or in any way distracting you from the fact that there's an obvious solution yeah my biggest pet peeve being like i don't have time to explain it to you and like pushing it. it's like well you right. do as you're running down the street but <laughs> I, I for some reason the first movie that comes to mind is serendipity right john cusack uh, movie where it's a well we'll we'll write something in a book and then the book will come back to us well now this is you you've just created an obstacle for yourself uh <laughs> and if you two really liked each other you would just go get coffee but then there's no movie this movie is right. about this moment where these two people do this and i think what he's saying here is that this could easily be that that this mm-hmm. this this show would be over the moment he goes finds judge turpin and kills him and uh, they they haul him back to prison mm-hmm. uh that's and that's not a very exciting show there has to be a reason that we're taking the path that we're taking and that he's doing what he's doing and mrs lovett giving him this idea that no you can enjoy it uh you can mm-hmm. make this fun for yourself you can really live in the moment that's his justification and indeed the epiphany kind of tells us that that's where he's going to go because he, he says things like, you know, I'm alive at last and I'm full of joy. And it's like, the, oh, it's only when he turns his, his razors on the world that he can really take her advice and say, okay, yeah, I'm really, really going to take advantage of this because I'm going to kill everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to that end, I think like within the musical itself, I think uh, what I've discovered having gone back in time and watched a bunch of the original, like the, the silent film of Sweeney Todd and there's a 1930s version of Sweeney Todd and even the original Penny Dreadful where he is just evil. Like that's this is thing. He's just an evil barber who goes and kills people. <laughs> and, in, and in the musical, it's it's a very different thing. And a lot of that is based on the Christopher Bond play that came before it. A lot of that was kind of made in that in that play. I, I think it's just so more dramatically interesting to have this instrument of evil, I guess we'll call it but also be kind of sympathetic at the same time. Like that's a hard line to, to walk down, I think. And yet it seems, uh, but by the end of this, I'm like, boy, like, like I don't really love the fact that you went and murdered a bunch of innocent people. (laughs) But at the same time, I feel really bad for you because everyone's lying to you and everyone is forcing you to do these things and seeing how they can abuse your trust or abuse your nature. So I don't know. I don't know if you have anything to add on to that about the characterization of Sweeney Todd, the character. I, I, I no, I think you're right. It's a dazzling trick. Yeah. I mean, to, to make you like this guy because he 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 does horrible, horrible things. We were we were watching this actually with my son. Mm-hmm. And every time in the movie, you know, of course, he doesn't just kill these people. You get a huge spray <laughs> of blood, blood yeah. this geysers from the neck. And each time my wife would say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> because I think we get drawn in by the beautiful melodies. And this is a mm-hmm. lovely melody that Ricky yeah. has. Uh, we, we, we get drawn into it. And there, there's the fun of, oh, we're going to make fun of all these professions. And it's like, yeah, but they're all it's all about murder. And and to actually see it played out is to you have to remember, OK, I, I like him and I still want him to get his comeuppance mm-hmm. uh, because he's he's ultimately a pretty awful person. But no one, well, almost no one really comes out of this you know, smelling sweet. No, no, uh, no. The, the, this, this London is, is, is pretty dark. <laughs> One last thing I just want to point out again, talking about language and the use of words, P- potentially my favorite line from this entire song is half the fun is to plan the plan. Mostly again, because you're using the word plan again, both as a, a noun and then um, a verb, I guess, in this clay, in, yes. in this case. So, I always love it when people can do that, use that turn of phrase and use the word in its two different meanings at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure he looks for those moments because they they give you a rhyme. They give you a repetition without cheating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's very always very concerned about cheating. He's worried about, oh, that, that this is a trick that's not a real rhyme. It's a slant <laughs> rhyme. So I don't want to use that or it the meter is broken. So I don't want to do that. And it allows him to repeat a word and get that poetic rhythmic feel to it without breaking the rules. It's like, mm-hmm. no, uh, the here plan is a verb and here plan is the noun. And, it's, it, and he's waited till the end of the song too. He's, he's, he's been very deft. He's lured you in. It's like, now I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with the, 
this this little trick here at the end. So he 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 knows how to save his moments. I mean, I am basically a broken record at this point because I always bring <laughs> up this fact, which is what I have always loved about Sondheim is that there are certain songs where you could just have characters speak them and they would work. Sure, they're they're rhyming here, but you could perform these in a way that I don't even know if people would pick up on the fact that there's a rhyme scheme going on and that that happens <laughs> throughout this song. But even but the, the, this last section, especially. Well, it is a very heavily rhymed song. Yeah. I'll, 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 my my moment of poetry knowledge. I mean, if you look at each stanza, there's a, it's, it's an A, B, C, B. Mm-hmm. db mm-hmm. and then and then wait so he's just he's coming back to the the rhyme in the middle but i think the the pointedness and the pithiness of the words gives it a, a momentum that almost yeah. makes it feel like it's it's it fits it fits her and it, it fits the moment and it, it fits because i you know he's he's rather fond of waiting songs i mean my first thought of what was the song like i thought of cool because that's right. a song that does, f- serves the same purpose. Let's let's hold back, guys. Let's not jump right into this. It's it's serving that same role. But of course, he has uh, someone is waiting in company, which yeah. is one of Bobby's many moments of hesitation. Uh, we have waiting for the girls upstairs uh, from Follies. Follies. Yeah. Uh, and I, it's it's not quite a wait song, but I always think of "Stay with Me" in "Into the Woods" is mm-hmm. another. Don't don't change what's going on. But of course, he actually gets to play both sides of that because I think it's the moment where the baker and his wife are singing, and he the baker is saying, "Let's not rush into this," and she's saying, "No, we're going to go out and, and get these uh, get get the four things that we need to to right. to make up the potion." And he she's actually playing the Sweeney role of "I want to rush into action." I guess, I guess this is what I'm saying is this is where Hamilton got weight for me is from every every Sondheim moment. <laughs> yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Hamilton rips Sondheim off is what I'm trying to say. Exactly. That's that's what I'm trying to say. So I guess overall for for this song, like where would you rate this as far as the rest of the scores is top five, middle five, bottom five? Where would you put it? I mean, it's it's, you know, as a song, it's pleasant. It's just, it's a pleasant song and it's, it's of a nature that you could pull it out. You know, there's no characters named, there's the, there's no specific moments reference. So it feels like it could stand alone. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not an essential song. It's not a a song I would rush back to. It's, it's not a, it's not a terrible song. It's not, it's not sweet Polly Plunkett. Um, (laughs) So it, it, it feels like a middle of the road song, but having spent time with the song now, it it feels like a keystone. It feels like one of those pieces that you need to hold up the whole bridge uh that if you pull it out it's like no it's really served a a really vital purpose and i think it's noteworthy that of all the the trims that the movie made uh they made the decision this song has to stay and i think dramatically it serves such an important role that the the show relies upon it even if it's not a a great song in and of itself what did richard rogers call uh, like fundamentals or something like that the fun like songs that have to be in your score or else kind of the whole score falls apart like you need them just to be there and they're usually not going to be people's favorite songs from the show but it's like you need them (laughs) to be there so it kind of it balances the rest of the scores out that's kind of what this song reminds me of is like you would miss this song if it's not there but yeah it's not going to be very many people's like oh my gosh you have to listen to this song wait from the musical sweeney todd right and i think you know sondheim just sees an opportunity that of course this could be as you said one or two lines of dialogue Mm -hmm. just calm yourself well your moment will come you'll kill him everything will be great uh and he says uh, we we can dive in a little more and we can really flesh out this relationship and Mm -hmm. see how mrs lovett is manipulating sweeney todd as much as he is still focused on his ultimate goal well, Shane, thank you so much for joining me here today. If people wanted to see what you're up to, stay in contact with you online, what's the best ways for them to do so? Great question. I, uh, I'm on Twitter at Shane Wilson Says, uh, but I, it is not frequently used. Uh, our, uh, our podcast, The Completist, has its own, uh, its own Twitter handle. I believe it's The Completist Pod. Uh, at the completest pod. So look for that. Uh, but you can also find uh, find that podcast uh, wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find some of my writings over at 366 Weird Movies, uh, mm-hmm. where I do uh, occasional movie reviews. Uh, so any of those I think will work if you'd like to track me down. What's the last weird movie you watched? 
Uh, the last weird movie I watched is a movie called Phase Four. Okay. It's a mid seventies horror movie directed by Saul Bass. Oh wow! Who's okay. The fame, he's famous for his title sequences and yeah. posters. This is the only feature he directed, and it's about uh, ants that are threatening to take over the world. <laughs> so right up, right, right, right in the same same yeah. wheelhouse with Sweeney Todd. Really, I, I don't know if it is true for that movie. I've not, I've not seen it, but I've always find that when I hear descriptions like that. Uh, and I go and seek out those movies like this has to be like the most bonkers thing. I'm always so disappointed when it's like, oh, no, it's just more boring than it is <laughs> like weird. I don't know. What, 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 where would you rate it on, on your scale? Is it an actual weird movie or is it more of just like, eh? it's uh, it's mostly weird because it defies your expectations. I think you're expecting a King of the Spiders mm. or, uh, you know. Yeah, you know, them. You're you're thinking yeah. of a big monster horror movie, and instead, it's very psychological and it's very slow paced. Mm -hmm. And so, I think it it feels weird because it's not the way you expect a story like this to be told, and because it has very unique visuals. Uh, I don't know if it's ultimately going to make the list. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm 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 just a, a contributor. A wonderful man named Greg Smalley runs the website, and I promise you, if you go through his list of 366 movies, uh, you will find movies that will. Will not defy your expectation for weirdness they will yeah. they will absolutely live up to it so i don't know if phase four will quite make it but it makes a good go of it good now here's the hardest question what i've been doing this season of course ending things off is asking you what is your favorite pie ah uh. Uh, uh, I will say that I, the pie I love to make is an apple pie, mm -hmm. uh, just a classic uh, crosshatch uh, country style apple pie. But I think I really enjoy eating uh, a well-made chicken pot pie. Mm. I think a nice flaky crust, uh, you know, a thick, creamy uh, innards. I think that's uh, that that's something I always enjoy. <laughs> Great. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Creamy innards is what we're all looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's really in keeping with the theme. That's right. That's right. Thanks, Shane. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network and to the Edmonton Community Foundation this week. Putting It Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, Kiss Me, the song. That's not an instruction for you. Unless, I don't know, you're into that sort of thing. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now.